It was only about 90 minutes ago that Judge Ingrid Bakke started to read the verdict in Boulder this afternoon. Yeah, Boulder jury needed less than about six hours to determine the Boulder King super shooter Ahmad Alisa was guilty on all 55 felony counts. Nine News reporter Kelly Grinke is live from outside of the courthouse. She's been following this trial and brings us the latest happening now. Kelly. Hey guys, good afternoon. Those victim impact statements are still continuing and usually when victim impact statements happen, it's an, an opportunity for families to ask the judge to give a specific sentence. But there's no question that the shooter uh, will spend the rest of his life behind bars. This was a relatively quick verdict, two weeks of a trial and the jury deliberated about six hours before finding him guilty on all counts. There was no question that he was the shooter that day, but what the jury had to decide was whether or not he was insane during the day of the shooting, the moment that he pulled that trigger and the jury today decided that he was sane during the time of the shooting. The prosecution had called up two uh, psychologists who had concluded that he was sane, but the defense did not have a single expert who said that uh, he was insane during the time of the shooting. The defense attorneys um, relied heavily on the testimony of the shooter's family, calling up his parents, his siblings, who described him as someone who over the last couple of years grew isolated, paranoid after high school, um, but that they, um, you know, had said that he was struggling. Um, and so they were really trying to rely on their testimony to say that he was not doing well. We actually were able to speak to the older brother of the shooter as he was walking outside of the courtroom after that verdict was read. Here's what he told us. We've never seen him hit a child. We've never seen him, you know, like uh, yell at a mother or a sister or a brother or any of that. He was always the calm, nice person into himself, withdraw from the family, like up to a level. One time, my younger brother who was with us, he was smoking a hookah and came to him and tell him, give me this hookah. This is mine. And Ahmed is the one who made it. Ahmed he smiled and left him. Uh, the family has said that they really had no idea that he would do something like this, that when they got that call that he had committed this horrible crime, they say it was a complete shock to them that they only heard the name uh, or the diagnosis of schizophrenia until doctors started talking to them after the shooting. The older brother had told me uh, he was he was becoming incredibly defensive uh, that if they had known that he would have done something like this, um, that they would have tried to do something. They were all living in the same house um, and he said that they had seen that he was becoming very isolated but never thought that it would result into a mass shooting. Um, again, we're really trying to uh, wait for hearing from those families who are making those victim impact statements. Um, and as you guys know, this is an incredibly emotional time for the family, but really an opportunity for them to speak for their loved ones who are no longer here. Yeah, and those impact statements are still going on and likely will throughout the afternoon. Kelly, thank you for that perspective. You know, we want to talk about uh, what what this means now because uh, Chris Vanderbeen's with us. And, and when Kelly talks about the family not really knowing what the shooter was capable of or even imagining what he was capable of, that sadly is a story we've heard before. It is a story, and it's one of those stories that will be repeated after the end of this story. This was a story where lots of people continue to ask why. It's a question that lots of people in Boulder were asking back in March of 2021 when this happened. And here we are three years, more than three years later, and people are still asking why. Why did this happen? Why did these events unfold inside of King Supers near the intersection of Table Mesa and Broadway back three years ago in latter part of March of 2021? Why were so many lives impacted by this? Why were 10 people killed? Why were immeasurable amounts of, of lives impacted, families' lives impacted by all of this? Here we are. We've now reached the sentencing phase of this trial, and we are still not at a point where we can effectively say, answer the question why. The family, which is really the first time we've been able to hear from them, has offered some explanations that this person in their mind was mentally ill, uh, that, that was schizophrenic, was having all of these issues. Um, but that still doesn't answer why. We did learn a lot in the course of a trial three and a half years later that did paint a, a much more clear picture of what happened in that hour, in that 58 minutes in the store that, that was dark to most of us. But like you say, the, the why question still lingers. Well, when you have an event like this, 
you want to believe that we can be three years later and come up with an answer to that question of why, and we don't. We know precisely what happened inside the King Supers. We know precisely who was killed when. It's very methodical, these investigations from beginning to end. We know precisely what minute. We know how many seconds it took from beginning to end because a lot of this was captured on video. We know as soon as the officer responded, what, what point that, that the Boulder police officer was shot and killed in all this. We know all of that. And yet, what we don't know is, why did he decide to go to that King Supers on that day and open fire on so many people? And that reminds me, I think, of, of more than any of the, of the mysterious mass shootings. Usually there's, there's a line, a through line, of some specific form of hatred, anger, revenge, something like that. But like the Las Vegas uh, mass killing, it, we never really got an answer. This one still hangs in the air. Well, it's, it sort of feels still like that confluence of of a, of a bad mental health care system in this country where lots of families, I heard that family speaking after, the, after, after, this, after the, he was sent, after he was found guilty today, I heard the family talking about, we had problems, there were some issues that were coming up. We'd never heard the term schizophrenia inv involved until we heard it in court. We've heard other families say that, but it's this confluence of, of, of a woefully inept uh, mental health care system when it comes to these specific kinds of cases and also access to guns, access to weapons, and then, and then just some questions we're just not going to have answers to. And we may be at that point, sadly enough. You know, one of the powerful things prosecutors kept saying throughout this trial is mentally ill does not equal insane. Having a mental illness, being schizophrenic, does not equal insane on the day that this happened. And that's essentially what, you know, the Boulder jury decided as well, completely um, Claiming that the shooter was insane at the time uh, is something that they did not agree with ultimately. Well, and think about th there's this idea of like insanity and mental illness. They do not go hand in hand. In this country, a large percentage of people are classified in some way or another as mentally ill through varying levels. Insanity is a different level where somebody is unable to distinguish, in essence, the simple way of putting it, the difference between right and wrong. And that was, especially in a high profile case like this, we saw this in the theater shooting in the, in, in the trial back in 2015, where a jury was also asked a very similar question. Was the shooter in that case so uh, mentally ill that they were in, insane and thus incapable of making the distinction, distinction between right and wrong? In that case, the jury said no. In this case, the jury is also saying no. We believe that he was able to make that distinction. And what I think the prosecution was very effective was going through sort of moment by moment, decisions that he made not only that day, but in the days leading up to the shooting that told the jury, no, this is not an insanity defense. So uh, about an hour ago, the verdicts were read. Uh, they were anticipated. And I think many people uh, saw the writing on the wall. They knew what was coming. They were prepared for it. And while monumental, but it is now that these victim impact statements are going on where people get to pour out some of what they've had to keep inside for the three and a half years since their, their loved ones were murdered. Everything from rage to sorrow to sadness to forgiveness, all of these things get to be expressed in, in words that they may think they're prepared to deliver, but as we saw with Nikolina Stanisic, suddenly when you have to say it out loud and, and that person who caused all of this is right next to you and a room is filled with people and cameras are on you, it's, it's high drama. It is high drama and it is also an imperfect system because what we have is, is a system that, that keeps victims and their families relatively silent for three and a half years. And what you're seeing right now that's taking place live in a Boulder County courtroom right now is really the first opportunity for the families to tell a judge, to tell the public, to tell the world, this is what happened in their life. We talked about this a little bit earlier today where we talked about it's, it's very common for us to sort of lump all of the victims together as one. They're just the, the King Supers shooting victims. There are 10 very unique stories mm -hmm. from 10 very unique families and they all have a very individualized story to tell. Yep, and you can hear those as the victim impact statements continue on. If you want to check out 9news.com or 9news+, you can follow along and hear that emotional um, testimony.